the cat that walked by himself. Hear and attend and listen, for this befell and behappened and became and was, O oh my best beloved, when the tame animals were wild. The dog was wild, and the horse was wild, and the cow was wild, and the sheep was wild, and the pig was wild, as wild as wild could be, and they walked in the wet wild woods by their wild lone. The wildest of all the wild animals was the cat. He walked by himself, and all places were alike to him. Of course, the man was wild, too. He was dreadfully wild. He didn't even begin to be tame till he met the woman, and she told him that she did not like having, did not like living in his wild ways. He picked out a nice drive cave, a nice dry cave instead of a heap of wet leaves to lie down in, and she screwed clean sand on the floor, and she lit a nice fire of wood at the back of the cave, and she hung a dried wild horse skin, tail down, across the opening of the cave, and she said, wipe your feet, dear, when you come in, and now we'll keep house. That night, best beloved, they ate wild sheep roasted on the hot stone, and flavored with wild garlic and wild pepper, and wild stuffed with wild rice and wild fenugreek and wild coriander and marrow bones of wild oxen, wild cherries and wild grenadillas. Then the man went to sleep in front of the fire ever so happy, but the woman sat up combing her hair. She took the bone of the shoulder of mutton, the big fat blade bone, and she looked at the wonderful marks on it and she threw more wood on the fire. And she made a magic. She made the first singing magic in the world. Out in the wet wild woods, all the wild animals gathered together where they could see the light of the fire a long way off, and they wondered what it meant. Then Wild Horse stamped his wild foot and said, Oh, my friends and oh, my enemies. Why have the man and the woman made that great light in that great cave? And what harm will it do us? Wild Dog lifted up his wild nose and smelled the smell of roast mutton and said, I will go up and see and look and say, for I think it is good. Cat, come with me. Nanny, said the cat, I am the cat who walks by himself and all places are alike to me. I will not come. <laughs> and we can never be friends again, said Wild Dog. And he trotted off to the cave. When he had gone a little way, the cat said to himself, all places are alike to me. Why should I not go too and see and look and come away at my own liking? So he slipped after Wild Dog softly, very softly, and hid himself where he could hear everything. When Wild Dog reached the mouth of the cave, he lifted up the dried horse skin with his nose and sniffed the beautiful smell of the roast mutton. And the woman, looking at the blade bone, heard him and laughed and said, here comes the first wild thing out of the wild woods. What do you want? Wild Dog said, oh, my enemy and wife of my enemy. What is this that smells so good in the wild woods? Then the woman picked up a roasted mutton bone and threw it to the wild dog and said, Wild thing out of the wild woods, taste and try. Wild dog gnawed the bone, and it was more delicious than anything he had ever tasted. And he said, Oh, my enemy and wife of my enemy, give me another. The woman said, wild thing out of the wild woods, help my man to hunt through the day and guard this cave at night, and I will give you as many roast bones as you need. Ah, said the cat listening, this is a very wise woman, but she, this is a very wise woman, but she is not as wise as I am. Wild dog crawled into the cave and laid his head on the woman's lap and said, 
Oh, my friend and wife of my friend, I will help your man to hunt through the day, and at night I will guard your cave. Ah, said the cat to listen, that is a very foolish dog. And he went back through the wet wild woods, waving his wild tail and walking by his wild load, but he never told anybody. Then the man waked up and said, what is Wild Dog doing here? And the woman said, His name is not Wild Dog anymore. First friend, because he will be our friend for always and always and always. Take him with you when you go hunting. Next night, the woman cut great, cut great green armfuls of fresh grass from the water meadows and dried it before the fire so that it smelt like new mown hay. And she sat at the mouth of the cave and plaited a halter out of horsehide, and she looked at the shoulder of mutton bone, at the big broad blade bone, and she made a magic. She made the second singing magic in the world. Out in the wild woods, all the wild animals wondered what had happened to wild dog. And at last, a wild horse stamped with his foot and said, I will go and see and say why Wild Dog has not returned. Cat, come with me. Nanny, said the cat, I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. I will not come. But all the same, he followed Wild Horse softly, very softly, and hid himself where he could hear everything. When the woman heard Wild Horse tripping and stumbling on his long mane, she laughed and said, Here comes the second. Wild thing out of the wild woods, what do you want? Wild Horse said, Oh, my enemy, and wife of my enemy, where is Wild Dog? The woman laughed and picked up the blade bone and looked at it and said, Wild thing out of the wild woods, you did not come here for Wild Dog for the sake of this good grass. And Wild Horse, tripping and stumbling on his long mane, said, That is true. Give it to me to eat. The woman said, Wild thing out of the wild woods, bend your wild head and wear what I give you, and you shall eat the wonderful grass three times a day. Ah! said the cat listening. This is a clever woman, but she is not as clever as I am. Wild horse bent his wild head, and the woman slipped the plated hide halter over it, and wild horse breathed on the woman's feet and said, Oh, my mistress and wife of my master, I will be your servant for the sake of the wonderful grass. Ah, said the cat listening, that is a very foolish horse. And he went back through the wet wild woods, waving his wild tail and walking by his wild loom. But he never told anybody. When the man and the dog came back from hunting, the man said, What is a wild horse doing here? And the woman said, His name is not wild horse anymore, but the first servant, because he will carry us from place to place for always and always always. Ride on his back when you go hunting. Next day, holding her wild head high that her wild horn should not catch in the wild trees, wild cow came up to the cave, and the cat followed and hid himself just the same as before. And everything happened just the same as before, and the cat said the same things as before. And when Wild Cow had promised to give her milk to the woman every day in exchange for the wonderful grass, the cat went back through the wet wild woods waving his wild tail and walking by his wild lone, just the same as before. But he never told anybody. And when the man and the horse and the dog came home from hunting and asked the same question, same as before, the woman said, Her name is not Wild Cow anymore the giver of good food. He will give us the warm white milk for always and always 
and always, and I will take care of her while you and the first friend and the first servant go hunting. Next day, the cat waited to see if any other wild thing would go up to the cave, but no one moved in the wet wild woods. So the cat walked there by himself, and he saw the woman milking the cow, and he saw the light of the fire in the cave, and he smelt the smell of the warm white milk. The cat said, Oh, enemy, uh, and wife of my enemy, where did wild cow go? The woman laughed and said, <laughs> Wild thing out of the wild woods, go back to the woods again, for I have braided up my hair and I have put away the magic blade bone, and we have no more need of either friends or servants in our cave. Cat said, I am not a friend, and I am not a servant. I am the cat who walks by himself, and I wish to come into your cave. Woman said, Then why did you not come with first friend on the first night? Cat grew very angry and said, has wild dog told tales of me? Then the woman laughed and said, <laughs> you are the cat who walks by himself and all places are alike to you. You are neither a friend nor a servant. You have said it yourself. Go away and walk by yourself in all places alike. Then cat pretended to be sorry and said, must I never come into the cave? Must I never sit by the warm fire? Must I never drink the warm white milk? You are very wise and very beautiful. You should not be cruel, even to a cat. Woman said, I knew I was wise, but I did not know I was beautiful. So I will make a bargain with you. If ever I say one word in your praise, you may come into the cave. And if you say two words in my praise, said the cat. I never shall, said the woman. But if I say two words in your praise, you may sit by the fire in the cave. And if you say three words, said the cat. I never shall, said the woman. But if I say three words in your praise, you may drink the warm white milk three times a day for always and always and always. Then the cat arched his back and said, Now let the curtain at the mouth of the cave and the fire at the back of the cave and the milk pots that stand beside the fire. Remember what my enemy and the wife of my enemy has said. And he went away through the wet wild woods, waving his wild tail and walking by his wild lone. That night, when the man and the horse and the dog came home from hunting, the woman did not tell them of the bargain that she had made with the cat, because she was afraid that they may not like it. Cat went far and far away and hid himself in the wet wild woods by his wild lone for a long time till the woman forgot all about him only the bat the little upside down bat that hung inside the cave knew where the cat hid and every evening bat would fly to cat with news of what was happening one evening bat said there is a baby in the cave he is new and pink and fat and small and the woman is very fond of him. Ah, said the cat, listening. But what is the baby fond of? He is fond of things that are soft and pickle, said the bat. He is fond of warm things to hold in his arms when he goes to sleep. He is fond of being played with. He is fond of all those things. Ah, said the cat, listening. Then my time has come. Next night, Cat walked through the wet wild woods and hid very near the cave till morning time, and man and dog and horse went hunting. The woman was busy cooking that morning, and the baby cried and interrupted. So she carried him outside the cave and gave him a handful of pebbles to play with, but still the baby cried. Then the cat put out his paddy paw and patted the baby on the cheek and it cooed, 
and the cat rubbed against its fat knees and tickled it under its fat chin with his tail, and the baby laughed, and the woman heard him and smiled. Then the bat, the little upside-down bat, that hung in the mouth of the cave, said, Oh, my hostess, and wife of my host, and mother of my host's son, a wild thing from the wild woods is most beautifully playing with your baby. A blessing on that wild thing, whoever he may be, said the woman, straightening her back, for I was a busy woman this morning, and he has done me a service. The very minute and second, best beloved, the dried horse-skin curtain that was stretched pale down at the mouth of the cave fell down, whoosh, because it remembered the bargain she had made with the cat. And when the woman went to pick it up, lo and behold, the cat was sitting quite comfy inside the cave. Oh, my enemy, and wife of my enemy, and mother of my enemy, said the cat, it is I for you have spoken a word in my praise, and now I can sit within the cave for always and always and always. But still, I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. The woman was very angry and shut her lips tight and took up her spinning wheel and began to spin. But the baby cried because the cat had gone away, and the woman could not hush it, for it struggled and kicked and grew black in the face. Oh, my enemy, and wife of my enemy, and mother of my enemy, said the cat, take a strand of the wire that you are spinning, and tie it to your spinning world, and drag it along the floor, and I will show you a magic that shall make your baby laugh as loudly as he is now crying. I will do so, said the woman, because I am at my wit's end, but I will not thank you for it. She tied the thread to the little place in the world and drew it across the floor, and the cat ran after it and patted it with his paws and rolled head over heels and tossed it backward over his shoulder and chased it between his hind legs and pretended to lose it and pounced down upon it again till the baby laughed as loudly as it had been crying, and scrambled after the cat and frolicked all over the cave till it grew tired and settled down to sleep with the cat in its arms. Now, said the cat, I will sing the baby a song that shall keep him asleep for an hour. And he began to purr, loud and low, low and loud, till the baby fell fast asleep. The woman smiled as she looked down upon the two of them and said, That was wonderful. That was wonderfully done. No question, but you are very clever, O oh cat. That very minute and second, best beloved, the smoke of the fire at the back of the cave came down in clouds from the roof, puff, because it remembered the bargain she had made with the cat, and when it had cleared away, lo and behold, the cat was sitting quite comfy close to the fire. Oh, my enemy, and wife of my enemy, and mother of my enemy, said the cat. It is I who have spoken a second word in my praise, and now I can sit by the warm fire at the back of the cave for always and always and always. But still, I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. Then the woman was very, very angry and let down her hair to put more wood on the fire and brought out the broad blade bone of the shoulder of mutton and began to make a magic that should prevent her from saying a third word in praise of the cat. It was not a singing magic, best beloved. It was a still magic. And by and by the cave grew so still that a little wee wee mouse crept out of a corner and ran across the floor. Oh, my enemy, and wife of my enemy, and mother of my enemy, said the cat, is that little mouse part of your magic? <clears throat> oh, gee, no indeed, said the woman, and she dropped the blade bone and jumped upon the footstool in front of the fire and braided up her hair very quick for fear that the mouse should run up it. Ah, said the cat, watching. 
certain the mouse will do me no harm if I eat it? No, said the woman, braiding up her hair. Eat it quickly, and I will ever be grateful to you. Pat made one jump and caught the little mouse, and the woman said, A hundred thanks. Even the first friend is not quick enough to catch little mice, as you have done. You must be very wise. That very moment and second, O oh best beloved, the milk pot that stood by the fire cracked in two pieces, because it remembered the bargain she had made with the cat. And when the woman jumped down from the footstool, lo and behold, the cat was lapping up the warm white milk that lay in one of the broken pieces. Oh, my enemy, and wife of my enemy, and mother of my enemy, said the cat. It is I, for you have spoken three words in my praise, and now I can drink the warm white milk three times a day for always and always and always. But still, I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. Then the woman laughed and set the cat a bowl of the warm white milk and said, Oh, cat, you are as clever as a man, but remember that your bargain was not made with the man or the dog, and I do not know what they will do when they come home. What is it to me, said the cat, if I have my place in the cave by the fire and my warm white milk three times a day, I do not care what the man or the dog can do. That evening, when the man and the dog came into the cave, the woman told them all the story of the bargain while the cat sat by the fire and smiled. Then the man said, Yes, but he has not made a bargain with me, or with all proper men after me. Then he took off his two leather boots, and he took up his little stone axe, that makes three, and he fetched a piece of wood and a hatchet, that is five altogether, and he set them out in a row, and he said, Now we will make our bargain. If you do not catch mice when you are in the cave for always and always and always, I will throw these five things at you whenever I see you, and so shall all proper men do after me. Ah, said the woman, listening, this is a very clever cat, but he is not so clever as my man. The cat counted the five things, and they looked very knobby, and he said, I will catch mice when I am in the cave for always and always and always. But still, I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. <clears throat> not when I am near, said the man. If you had not said that last, I would have put all these things away for always and always and always. But I am now going to throw my two boots and my little stone axe that makes three, at you whenever I meet you, and so shall all proper men do after me. Then the dog said, wait a minute, he has not made a bargain with me, or with all proper dogs after me. And he showed his teeth and said, if you are not kind to the baby while I'm in the cave, for always and always and always, I will hunt you till I catch you, and when I catch you, I will bite you. And so shall all proper dogs do after me. Ah, said the woman, listening. This is a very clever cat, but he is not so clever as the dog. Cat counted the dog's teeth, and they looked very pointed. And he said, I will be kind to the baby while I am in the cave, as long as he does not pull my tail too hard, for always and always and always. Still, I am the cat that walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. Not when I am here, said the dog. If you had not said that last, I would have shut my mouth for always and always and always. But now I'm going to hunt you up a tree whenever I meet you, and so shall all proper dogs do after me. Then the man threw his two boots and his little stone axe, that makes three, at the cat, and the cat ran out of the cave, and the dog chased him up a tree. And from that day to this, best beloved, three proper men out of five will always 
throw things at a cat whenever they meet them. All proper dogs will chase him up a tree. But the cat keeps his side of the bargain too. He will kill mice and he will be kind to babies when he is in the house, just as long as they do not pull his tail too hard. But when he has done that, and between times, and when the moon gets up and night comes, he is the cat that walks by himself, and all places are alike to him. Then he goes out to the wet wild woods, or up the wet wild trees, or on the wet wild roots, waving his wild tail and walking by his wild moan. Pussy can sit by the fire and sing. Pussy can climb a tree or play with a silly old cork and string to amuse herself, not me. But I like Binky, my dog, because he knows how to behave. So Binky is the same as a first friend was, and I am the man in the cave. Pussy will play Man Friday till it's time to wet her paw and make her walk on the window sill for the footprint Crusoe saw. Then she fluffles her tail and mews and scratches and won't attend. Binky will play whatever I choose, and he is my true first friend. Pussy will rub my knees with her head, pretending she loves me hard. But the very minute I go to my bed, Pussy runs out into the yard. And there she stays till the morning light, so I know it is only pretend. But Binky snores at my feet all night, and he is my firstest friend. That is the picture of the cave where the man and the woman lived first of all. It was really a very nice cave and much warmer than it looks. The man had a canoe. It is on the edge of the river being soaked in the water to make it swell up. The tattery looking thing across the river is a man's salmon net to catch salmon with. There are nice clean stones leading up from the river to the mouth of the cave so that the man and the woman could go down for water without getting sand between their toes. The things like black beetles far down on the beach are really trunks of dead trees that floated down the river from the wet wild woods on the other bank. The man and the woman used to drag them out and dry them and cut them up for firewood. I haven't drawn the horsehide curtain at the mouth of the cave because the woman has just taken it down to be cleaned. All those little smudges on the sand between the cave and the river are the marks of the woman's feet and the man's feet. The man and the woman are both inside the cave eating their dinner. They went to another cozier cave when the baby came because the baby used to crawl down to the river and fall in and the dog had to pull him out. That is a picture of the cat that walked by himself, walking by his wild lone through the wet wild woods and waving his wild tail. There is nothing else in the picture except some toadstools. They had to grow there because the woods were so wet. The lumpy thing on the low branch isn't a bird. It is moss that grew there because the wild woods were so wet. Underneath the truly picture is a picture of the cozy cave that the man and the woman went to after the baby cave. It was their summer cave and they planted wheat in front of it. The man is riding on the horse to find the cow and bring her back to the cave to be milked. He is holding up his hand to call the dog who has swum across to the other side of the river looking for rabbits. The butterfly that stamped. This, oh my best beloved, is a story, a new and a wonderful story, a story quite different from the other stories, a story about the most wise sovereign, Solomon bin Daoud, Solomon, the son of David. There are 355 stories about Solomon bin Daoud, but this is not one of them. It is not the story of the lapwing 
who found the water, or the Hupi who shaded Solomon Bad bin Daoud from the heat. It is not the story of the glass pavement, or the ruby with the crooked hole, or the gold bars of Balti. It is the story of the butterfly that stamped. Now, attend all over again and listen. Solomon bin Daoud was wise. He understood what the beasts said, what the birds said, what the fishes said, and what the insects said understood what the rocks said deep under the earth when they bowed in towards each other and groaned, and he understood what the trees said when they rustled in the middle of the morning. He understood everything, from the bishop on the bench to the hyssop on the wall, and Balkis, his head queen, the most beautiful queen Balkis, was nearly as wise as he was. Solomon bin Daoud was strong, Upon the third finger of the right hand, he wore a ring. When he turned it once, Afrits and Jinns came out of the earth to do whatever he told them. When he turned it twice, fairies came down from the sky to do whatever he told them. And when he turned it three times, the very great angel Azrael of the sword came dressed as a water carrier and told him the news of the three worlds above, below, and here. And yet, Solomon bin, da bin Daoud was not proud. He very seldom showed off, and when he did, he was sorry for it. Once he tried to feed all the animals in all the world in one day, but when the food was ready, an animal came out of the deep sea and ate it up in three mouthfuls. Solomon bin Daoud was very surprised and said, O oh, animal, who are you? And the animal said, O oh, king, live forever. I am the smallest of 30,000 brothers, and our home is at the bottom of the sea. We heard that you were going to feed all the animals in the world, and my brother sent me to ask when dinner would be ready. Solomon bin Daoud was more surprised than ever and said, Oh, animal, you have eaten all the dinner that I made ready for all the animals in the world. And the animal said, Oh, king, Live forever, but do you really call that a dinner? Where I come from, we each eat twice as much as that between meals. Then Solomon bin Daoud fell flat on his face and said, O oh, animal, I gave that dinner to show what a great and rich king I was, and not because I really wanted to be kind to the animals. Now I am ashamed, and it serves me right. Solomon bin Daoud was a really, truly wise man, best beloved. After that, he never forgot that it was silly to show off. And now the real story part of my story begins. He married ever so many wives. He married 999 wives, besides the most beautiful Bakis, and they all lived in a great golden palace in the middle of a lovely garden with fountains didn't really want 999 wives. In those days, everybody married ever so many wives. And of course, the king had to marry ever so many more just to show that he was the king. Some of the wives were nice. But some were simply horrid. And the horrid one quarreled with the nice ones and made them horrid too. And then they would all quarrel with Solomon bin Daoud, and that was horrid for him. But the most beautiful, never quarreled with Solomon bin Daoud. She loved him too much. She sat in her rooms in the Golden Palace or walked in the palace garden and was truly sorry for him. Of course, if he had chosen to turn his ring on his finger and call it the Jinns and the Afrites, they would have magicked all those 999 quarrelsome wives into white mules of the desert or greyhounds or pomegranate seeds. But Solomon bin Daoud thought that that would be showing off. So when they quarreled too much, he only walked by himself in one part of the beautiful palace garden and wished he had never been born. One day, when they had quarreled for three weeks, all 999 wives together, Solomon bin Daoud went out for peace and quiet as usual. And among the orange trees, he met Balki, the most beautiful, very sorrowful because Solomon bin Daoud was so worried. And she said to him, 
O oh my Lord, and light of my eyes, turn the ring upon your finger and show the, these queens of Egypt and Mesopotamia and Persia and China that you are the great and terrible king. But Solomon bin Daoud shook his head and said, O oh my lady and the light of my life, remember the animal that came out of the sea and made me ashamed before all the animals in all the world because I showed off. Now, if I showed off before these queens of Persia and Egypt and Abyssinia and China, merely because they worry me, I might be made even more ashamed than I have been. And Maki, the most beautiful, said, O oh, my Lord and treasure of my soul, what will you do? And Solomon bin Daoud said, O oh, my lady, and content of my heart, I shall continue to endure my fate at the hands of these 999 queens who vex me with their continual quarreling. So he went on between the lilies and loquats and the roses and the cannons and the heavy scented ginger plants that grew in the garden till he came to the great camphor tree that was called the camphor tree of Solomon bin Daoud. But Balkis is a kid among the tall irises and the spotted bamboos and the red lilies behind the camphor tree, so as to be nearer her own true love, Solomon bin Daoud. Presently, two butterflies flew under the tree, quarreling. Solomon bin Daoud heard one say to the other, I wonder at your presumption in talking like this to me. Don't you know that if I stamped with my feet all Solomon bin Daoud's palace and this garden here would immediately vanish in a clap of thunder? <clears throat> then Solomon bin Daoud forgot his 999 bothersome wives and laughed till the camphor tree shook at the butterfly's boast, and he held out his finger and said, Little man, come here. The butterfly was dreadfully frightened, but he managed to fly up to the hand of Solomon bin Daoud and clung there, fanning himself. Solomon bin Daoud bent his head and whispered very softly, Little man, you know that all your stamping wouldn't bend one blade of grass. What made you tell that awful fib to your wife? For doubtless she is your wife. The butterfly looked at Solomon bin Daoud and saw the most wise king's eye twinkle like stars on a frosty night, and he picked up his courage with both wings, and he put his head on one side and said, O oh, king, live forever. She is my wife, and you know what wives are like. Solomon bin Daoud smiled in his beard and said, Yes, I know, little brother. One must get them in order somehow, said the butterfly, and she has been quarrelling with me all the morning. I said that to quiet her. And Solomon bin Daoud said, may it quiet her. Go back to your wife, little brother, and let me hear what you say. Back flew the butterfly to his wife, who was all of a twitter behind a leaf, and she said, I heard you. Solomon bin Daoud himself heard you. <clears throat> Heard me, said the butterfly. Of course he did. I meant him to hear me. And what did he say? Oh, what did he say? Well, said the butterfly, fanning himself most importantly, between you and me, my dear, of course I don't blame him, because his palace must have cost a great deal, and the oranges are just ripening. He asked me not to stop, and I promised I wouldn't Gracious, said his wife, and sat quite quiet, but Solomon bin Daoud laughed till the tears ran down his face at the impudence of the bad little butterfly. Balkis, the most beautiful, stood up behind the tree among the red lilies and smiled to herself, for she had heard all this talk. She thought, if I am very wise, I can yet save my lord from the persecutions of these quarrelsome queens, and she held out her finger and whispered softly to the butterfly's wife, little woman, come here, Up flew the butterfly's wife, very frightened, 
and clung to Bucky's white hand. Bucky bent her beautiful head down and whispered, Little woman, do you believe what your husband has just said? The butterfly's wife looked at Bucky and saw the most beautiful queen's eyes shining like deep pools with starlight on them. And she picked up her courage with both wings and said, Dear oh, queen, be lovely forever. You know what men folk are like. And the queen Bucky. The wise Balkis of Sheba put her hand to her lips to hide a smile and said, Little sister, I know. <clears throat> Get angry, said the butterfly's wife, fanning herself quickly, over nothing at all, but we must humour them. Oh, queen, they never mean half they say. If it pleases my husband to believe that I believe he can make Solomon bin Daoud's palace disappear by stopping his foot, I'm sure I don't care. He'll forget all about it tomorrow. <clears throat> Little sister, said Balky, you are quite right. But the next time he begins to boast, take him at his word. Ask him to stamp and see what will happen. We know what men folk are like, don't we? He'll be very much ashamed. Away flew the butterfly's wife to her husband, and in five minutes they were quarreling worse than ever. Remember, said the butterfly, remember what I can do if I stamp my foot. I don't believe you one little bit, said the butterfly's wife. I should very much like to see it done. Suppose you stamp now. I promised Solomon bin Daoud that I wouldn't, said the butterfly, and I don't want to break my promise. It wouldn't matter if you did said his wife. You couldn't bend a blade of grass with your stamping. I dare you to do it, she said. Stamp! 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 Solomon, then Daoud, sitting under the camphor tree, heard every word of this, and he laughed as he had never laughed in his life before. He forgot all about his queen. He forgot all about the animal that came out of the sea. He forgot about showing off just laughed with joy, and Balthus, on the other side of the tree, smiled because her own true love was so joyful. Presently, the butterfly, very hot and puffy, came whirling back under the shadow of the camphor tree and said to Solomon, he wants me to stamp. He wants to see what will happen. Oh, Solomon bin Daoud, you know I can't do it, and now she'll never believe a word I say. She'll laugh at me to the end of my days. <clears throat> no, little brother, said Solomon in Daoud. She will never laugh at you again. And he turned the ring on his finger, just for the little butterfly's sake, not for the sake of showing off. And lo and behold, four huge gins came out of the earth. <clears throat> Slaves, said Solomon bin Daoud. When this gentleman, my finger, that was where the impudent butterfly was sitting. Stamps his left front forefoot. You will make my palace and these gardens disappear in a clap of thunder. When he stamps again, you will bring them back carefully. Now, little brother, he said, go back to your wife and stamp all you've a mind to. Away flew the butterfly to his wife, who was crying. I dare you to do it. I you to do it. Stamp! Stamp now! Stamp! Bucky saw the four vast gins stoop down to the four corners of the garden with the palace in the middle, and she clapped her hands softly and said, At last, Solomon bin Daoud will do for the sake of a butterfly what he ought to have done long ago for his own sake, and the quarrelsome queens will be frightened. Then the butterfly stamped. The gins jerked the palace and the gardens a thousand miles into the air. There was a most awful thunderclap, and everything grew inky black. The butterfly's wife fluttered about in the dark, crying, It will all be good. I'm so sorry I spoke. Only bring the gardens back, my dear darling husband, and I'll never contradict again. The butterfly was nearly as frightened as his wife, 
and Solomon bin Daoud laughed so much that it was several minutes before he found breath enough to whisper to the butterfly, Thump again, little brother. Give me back my palace, most great magician. <laughs> yes, give him back his palace, said the butterfly's wife, still flying about in the dark like a moth. Give him back his palace, and don't let's have any more horrid magic. <laughs> well, my dear, said the butterfly as bravely as he could. You see what your nagging has led to? Of course, it doesn't make any difference to me. I'm used to this kind of thing. But as a favor to you and to Solomon bin Daoud, I don't mind putting things right. So he stamped once more, and that instant, and that instant the gins let down the palace and the gardens without even a bump. The sun shone on the dark green orange leaves. The fountains played among the pink Egyptian lilies. The birds went on singing, and the butterfly's wife lay on her side under the camphor tree, waggling her white, waggling her wings and panting. Oh, all be good, all be good. Solomon bin Daoud could hardly speak for laughing. He leaned back all weak and hiccupy and shook his finger at the butterfly and said, Oh, great wizard, what is the sense of returning to me, my palace, if at the same time you slay me with mirth? Then came a terrible noise, for all the 999 queens ran out of the palace, shrieking and shouting and calling for their baby. They hurried down the great marble steps below the fountain, 100 abreast, and the most wise Balkis went stately stately forward to meet them and said what is your trouble O queen they stood on the marble steps one hundred abreast and shouted what is our trouble we are we're living peacefully in our garden palace as is our custom when upon a sudden the palace disappeared and we were left sitting in a thick and noisome darkness and it thundered and jinns and afrites moved about in the darkness that is our trouble, O oh, head queen, and we are most extremely trouble on account of that trouble, for it was a troublesome trouble, unlike any trouble we have known. Then Balki, the most beautiful queen, Solomon bin Daoud, very best beloved, queen that was of Sheba and Sabi and the rivers of the gold of the south, from the desert of Zin to the towers of Zimbabwe, Balki almost as wise as the most wise Solomon bin Daoud himself said. It is nothing, O oh queens. A butterfly has made complaint against his wife because she quarreled with him, and it has pleased our lord Solomon bin Daoud to teach her a lesson in low speaking and humbleness. For that is counted a virtue among the wives of the butterflies. Then up and spoke the Egyptian queen, the daughter of a pharaoh, and she said, Our palace cannot be plucked up by the roots like a leek for the sake of a little insect. No, Solomon ben Daoud must be dead. And what we heard and saw was the earth thundering and darkening at the news. Then Balki beckoned that bold queen without looking at her and said to her and to the others, Come and see. They came down the marble steps. One hundred abreast, and beneath his camphor tree, still weak with laughing, they saw the most wise king Solomon bin Daoud rocking back and forth with a butterfly on either hand, and they heard him say, O oh, wife of my brother in the air, remember after this to please your husband in all things, lest he be provoked to stamp his foot yet again, for he has said that he is used to this magic, and he is most eminently a great magician, one who steals away the very palace of Solomon bin Daoud himself. Go in peace, little folk. And he kissed them on the wings, and they flew away. Then all the queens except Balkis, the most beautiful and splendid Balkis, who stood apart smiling, fell flat on their faces. They said, if these things are done when a butterfly is displeased with his wife, what shall be done to us who have vexed our king with our loud speaking and open quarreling through many days? Then they put their veils over their heads and they put their hands over their mouths and they tiptoed back 
to the palace most mousy quiet. Then Balthy, the most beautiful and excellent Balthies, went forward through the red lilies into the shade of the camphor tree and laid her hand upon Solomon bin Daoud's shoulder and said, O oh, my lord and treasure of my soul, rejoice, for we have taught the queens of Egypt and Ethiopia and Abyssinia and Persia and India and China with a great and a memorable teaching. And Solomon bin Daoud, still looking after the butterflies where they played in the sunlight, said, Oh, my lady, the jewel of my felicity, when did this happen? When I have been jesting with the butterfly ever since I came into the garden. And he told the Balkis what he had done. Balkis, the tender and most lovely Balkis, said, Oh, my lord, and the regent of my existence, I hid behind the camphor tree and saw it all. It was I who told the butterfly's wife to ask the butterfly to stamp, because I hoped that for the sake of the jest, my lord would make some great magic and that the queens would see it and be frightened. And she told him what the queens had said and seen and thought. Then Solomon bin Daoud rose up from his seat under the camphor tree and stretched his arms and rejoiced and said, Oh, my lady, and sweetener of my days, know that if I had made a magic against my queens for the sake of pride or anger, as I made that feast for all the animals, I should certainly have been put to shame. But by my means, by means of your wisdom, I made the magic for the sake of a jest and for the sake of a little butterfly. And behold, it has also delivered me from the vexation of my vexatious wives. Tell me therefore, O oh, my lady, and heart of my heart, how did you come to be so wise? And Balthy, the queen, beautiful and tall, looked up into Solomon bin Daoud's eyes and put her head a little on one side, just like the butterfly, and said, First, O oh, my lord, because I love you. And secondly, O oh, my lord, because I know what women folk are. Then they went up to the palace and lived happily ever afterwards. But wasn't it clever of Balthy? There was never a queen like Balthies, from here to the wide world's end. But Balthies talked to a butterfly, as you would talk to a friend. There was never a king like Solomon, not since the world began. But Solomon talked to a butterfly, as a man would talk to a man. She was queen of Sabea, and he was Asia's lord. But they both of them talked to butterflies when they took their walks abroad. That is the picture of the animal that came out of the sea and ate up all the food that Solomon bin Daoud had made ready for all the animals in all the world. He was really quite a nice animal, and his mummy was very fond of him, and of his 29,999 other brothers that lived at the bottom of the sea. You know that he was the smallest of them all, and so his name was Small Porgies. He ate up all those boxes and packets and bales and things that had been got ready for all the animals without ever once taking off the lids or untying the string, and it did not hurt him at all. The sticky up masts behind the boxes of food belonged to Solomon bin Daoud's ships. They were busy bringing more food when small porgies came ashore. He did not eat the ships. They stopped unloading the food and instantly sailed away to sea small porgies had quite finished eating. You can see some of the ships beginning to sail away by small porgies' shoulder. I have not drawn Solomon bin Daoud, but he is just outside the picture, very much astonished. The bundle hanging from the mast of the ship in the corner is really a package of wet bait for parrots to eat. I don't know the names of the ships. That is all there is in that picture. This is the picture of the four gull-winged jinn lifting up Solomon bin Daoud's place, palace. 
the very minute after the butterfly had stamped. The palace and the gardens and everything came up in one piece like a board, and they left a big hole in the ground all full of dust and smoke. If you look in the corner, close to the things that look like a lion, you will see Solomon bin Daoud with his magic stick and the two butterflies behind him. The thing that looks like a lion is really a lion carved in stone, and the thing that looks like a milk can is really a piece of a temple or a house or something. Solomon bin Daoud stood there so as to be out of the way of the dust and the smoke when the jinns lifted up the palace. I don't know the jinn's name. They were servants of Solomon bin Daoud ring, magic ring, and they changed about every day. They were just common gull-winged jinns. The thing at the bottom is a picture of a very friendly jinn called Akraig. He used to feed the little fishes in the sea three times a day, and his wings were made of pure copper. I put him in to show you what a nice jinn is like. He did not help to lift the palace. He was busy feeding little fishes in the Arabian Sea when it happened. And that is the end of Just So Stories.